for a lot of us who have our own kids, we often think we have the fullest lives, but by having such busy lives, we may also have the most opportunity for our kids' friends. And I've had a daughter who's very social, so by letting in her friends and then hosting them at our table, whatever the food happens to be that night, and then having conversation, one of those friends came to Jesus and started going to church with her regularly got baptized with her. I don't take credit for that or credit for any of it, just that we provided a space. You just start with what you have and offer it to those that you see around you, pray for those opportunities. It's like the field of dreams. Build it, they will come. If you have food, they will come. Welcome to Call Beyond, a Novo Mission podcast. We love sharing stories about how we can hear God speaking to us, as well as what happens when we say yes to His calling in our lives. Through these stories, we celebrate together the movement of God around the world beyond what we could ask or imagine. Well, welcome, guys, to another exciting episode of the Called Beyond podcast. I'm your host, Tim, and I am so excited to be joined by a couple of amazing guests today. We have Ruth Happ with us, as well as Jill Randall. Now, these two ladies have been serving God for a really long time. Both are trained educators. Both love imparting to other people that which God has been doing in their life and watching them move into new areas of their life, new areas of being, and hopefully pursuing the Lord. Uh, We're going to get into it with them, and we're going to kind of focus today's episode on something I'm really excited about, and that's this idea of both parenting and spiritually parenting next generations. Jill has three adult children um, that are married and grandkids, uh, and all the excitement with that. Ruth uh, has four kids, um, two youngers and two teenagers, and I'm, of course, excited to participate in this conversation, too, with three kids of my own, and really learning how to use what God has given us to impart not just to our own kids, but those others who need, seemingly need, what it is that the Lord has blessed us with. So, Ruth, welcome to the call. Jill, welcome to the call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you. to be here. Thanks for asking us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I would love to get into it. Um, first, probably with you, Jill, I have gotten to know you over the last few years and know that you and your husband, Bill, have just such a heart to give away what you know. I would love to just hear from you. Like, what has that looked like? How do you feel like you've kind of come to this place of just desiring to equip um, and give things away to people? Well, yeah, it did start like lots of years ago. (laughs) And when we were, uh, we lived on the East Coast and um, I won't even tell you what year that was, but uh, when Bill was in seminary and, uh, but we, when we planted our first church, it was kind of like, because we were in a college town, there was a lot of young adults and they just started Mm. coming to our church and we started finding leaders and it was just a, an uh, amazing opportunity to be able to pour into people and young adults. And then <clears throat> through the years, we, uh, we've just kept doing the same thing. We went back to the West coast, um, where we're from and, and we were in another college town. It just seems like it was like God was putting us in places where we could equip and release young adults. And, um, yeah, so it's been, Lots of different reiterations of it, lots of different ways that we've done that. We even had a ministry school at one point um, for young adults, too. So, yeah, we just had all different forms of that. Having one, you know, when we lived in Reading, we had probably 25 to 30 young adults in our living room every week uh, through the school year, just talking life, talking, you know, leadership, ministry, God, you know, deconstructing church, like all kinds of stuff. So yeah, that's, that's just it kind of in a nutshell, but yeah. Wow. That is so cool. So in other words, you didn't ask for it. (laughs) No, I don't think so. I think it just started. That's good. That's a good point. Yeah. Ruth, what does that look like? Maybe talk a little bit about that journey because it sounds, it's so intriguing to just hear how that has developed for you. Okay. Well, (laughs) I mean, a couple different things was from childhood. I always said I wanted to be a teacher. But then I also, in a more personal way as a kid, went through a lot with my family being just a struggling family. 
And Mm -hmm. um, there were some really dark times where I felt like my hope in a way was that someday I could help other people or Mm -hmm. relate, at least relate and have compassion on other people, like young people who went through similar experiences. And Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking, this is like upper grades of elementary school that I felt this way. And then as I got older and experienced people like Bill and Jill, who opened up their home, let me come in and have a safe space there Mm -hmm. and then at youth group and other teachers and people who kind of took me under their wing that gave me that sense of family that i didn't always have at home and a sense of an example of what it meant to follow christ and help Mm. other people see that maybe they didn't specifically talk to me but just being there and having that space so i think that put some dna in me that later as an adult whether i was a teacher or youth leader or a coach or however I live this out now, um, to carry that along with me, that idea. Yeah. I love, I love that, that, that even just the word coach, right. I mean, a lot of people think of sports teams and all that, but really it's having someone in your life that's invested in moving you forward, Mm -hmm. um, and seeing that come to fruition. I, I love that word. And I see that, you know, in kind of both of your callings and how the Lord mm-hmm. is using you, it's to help him to move people beyond where they are currently at. And mm-hmm. whether that's a place of being stuck um, or whether it's a place of just having big decisions, you know, to yeah. sort through mm-hmm. um, and to sit in a kind of a seat of discernment and experience and kind of help people to process um, mm-hmm. big things. And I think that's so, so important. I'm just curious, maybe give an example just so, you know, those that are listening can have an understanding as like, what does it look like to really Mm -hmm. invest in someone that maybe you didn't ask to even be able to invest in, in, in the fruit that that's, that's created in your own life as a result? I was thinking about this before we, uh, or when you guys asked us to do this. And I, I think creating a safe place for, for people is huge. I think a place where, there's a lot of grace and, Mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of time. I think there were people in the denomination that we used to be a part of that would say, Hey, what's your program? Like, how do you, how do you do all this with these young adults? And it's like, you go to a coffee shop and you sit down and you (laughs) listen. And uh, so, and like I said, a lot of grace, a lot of listening and talking less and listening more. And patience, you know, but I was, so when I was thinking about what's a fun story, I, I think the one that first comes to mind is a guy, he was actually my son's friend at the time he was in um, high school. And so I knew him, you know, when he'd come over and hang out with my son. And, uh, but as he grew, and as he was growing in the Lord and wanted, you know, more of his walk with God, he, he started hanging out with us. And he had similar, you know, like what Ruth was saying about a family. He didn't really have a great family. Just it was really important for him to to have people that believed in him. And so we totally did, and we still do. And it's been, well, he's in his 30s now, and we started when he was probably 18. And um, I was thinking about this because we, Bill and I laugh, you know, sometimes about it's got, it's the guy you least expect that's going to be like a powerhouse for God. Right. So this guy had the longest dreads you've ever seen. He had tattoos Mm. all over his body and Mm. he had a, you know, (laughs) a little bit of an edge to him, (laughs) but he was, he was my favorite. And so we hung out a ton. He ended up actually being my assistant in the school that I was running, um, at the time, our ministry school that we were, that I was running. But just to fast forward, the reason it came to mind was about two weeks ago, he sent a voice message to Bill and I. I'll, I'm going to probably get choked up, but uh, mm. he sent a voice message to us, and he was crying, actually. And mm. I don't really know what brought him to do this, but he just said, I just have to tell you that I would not be the dad or the husband or the man I am if I didn't have you guys in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, I mean, that's not why we do it to hear that, because we don't always hear that, you know, we don't always hear that. And I've made lots of mistakes. 
But to know that it, I always joke around because he's like, my, I have two boys. He's like my third boy, you know, mm -hmm. just because we were so invested in each other's mm -hmm. lives. So, so that's my positive story. <laughs> I can tell you a negative <laughs> one later. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Well, we, I mean, it's the good, bad, and the ugly, right? Um, right. That's right. And and I, I just say that there's 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 room for all of that stuff as 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 we go. I love. Um, well, and I, there were times even, Tim, that I can remember a time where I had to confront him on some stuff and and him, you know, just the interaction of trying to encourage him um, to continue to grow, you know, like there's because it's it's a messy relationship, too. It's not always this, yeah. you know, like a parent, like a parent, right? <laughs> it yeah. is your spiritual parent. So, you know, there there can be hard conversations, but there's it's a relationship, it's forgiveness, it's, you know, all that. So anyway. Yeah. So I guess, you know, to pivot that, you know, over to Ruth, kind of a similar question. What do you see in your mind when you think, man, I want to coach or I want to see the lights come on in people? Like what, what does that do for you? And maybe a, maybe a story, something mm -hmm. you went after um, or something that you found yourself um, with influence um, mm -hmm. And then some of the results that happened after that. Okay. So um, first of all, I, yeah, I went into teaching. That was the path. I thought this is right for me. Um, like we do in life. We think this is the plan, right? So I get into teaching after years of study, after assisting in classrooms, all that experience. But I found myself frustrated with not being able to talk about Jesus when I'd see these struggling kiddos who I can see there's so much more that they need and I can't really give it to them in a public school. And so this sense of calling toward missions, but this question around, well, how do I reach kids kind of shifted my thinking. And so that's where I've seen, so an example is one kiddo who I invited to this training that I, as part of the team I joined in Novo, training I developed, and um, he was very disruptive. <laughs> You know, all kinds of outwards, outbursts, like Jill said, like he's not the kind of guy that most people would probably want in the room because he's just going to disrupt and distract everyone. But I really felt like, no, I need to invite him. This was that I need to make space for him. And I'm sure that was a Holy Spirit led mm -hmm. decision. Um, because then as we're going through and processing personal life and the gospel and how it applies to them. So some teaching, but also coaching, mentoring, trying to bring that in with other adults as well you could see the wheels turning and him like shifting his mindset. And he, with some gracious like redirection, he stopped doing all the outbursts with some one-on-one -on -one conversation. He was just quiet, you know, without other kids hearing, looking at his life timeline, he was able to start, I think they're seeing how God really loved him and was there with him through all of that life junk that we all go through. And then throughout that time, 10 sessions or whatever, um, going to church and other people, I just want to add that it was a team effort. This wasn't a me parenting by myself. This was a, mm -hmm. I'm there kind of more as facilitator, but then we mm -hmm. also had a mentor who took special time with him. And then we had a grandma who was bringing him mm -hmm. from her neighborhood to church and people praying for him. And then during that time, he went home and told his mom, he'd become a Christian. And, mm -hmm. um, despite, wow. you know, then they were supportive, but not open really themselves. But mm -hmm. he became more of a leader and recruiter of other people, somebody you would never expect. <laughs> so wow. um, for me, that was like, okay, mm -hmm. there are ways to teach and coach, mentor, and we can all do different things. Mm -hmm. But the important thing was like this space for him, the love and kindness that we all showed him, this team effort working in different giftings, and then um, allowing him to some space to ask questions and continuing to disciple him, not like dropping him when he got disruptive, yeah. you know? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And I, I mean, I feel like this is one of like the, like the little, uh, little moments that we usually fill in at the end of episodes, but I just see this so clearly in what both of you guys just said is that, you know, watch out for the person that you least expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's mm -hmm. almost like the Lord, I mean, we, this is totally. written all throughout scripture, right? I mean, yeah, it's yeah. like, I don't know why it's so surprising to us, but right. like it's the lowest or the least likely or the edgiest or the person who's like literally persecuting <laughs> that becomes yeah, like the biggest player for God's kingdom. And I think there's this like, I'll, I'll just call it this 
holy aggression like within them uh, because of their story or because of where they came from is they know that they know who they were and who they are now. Mm -hmm. And there's this just desire to see God impact the lives of other people because they know who they were and who they are. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like the reality of who God is becomes um, amplified, you know, far beyond what it does, you know, I mean, potentially for myself, you know, for someone, you know, but I know who I was and I know who I am now. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's why I, I get to do what I do as well. And so I love that, um, from both your story. I think too, Tim, one thing I was just thinking too, it's like we both, Ruth and I both in different ways in our different gifting and all of that have basically taken on different ways of doing what Jesus did. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's how he treated his disciples. He did some teaching, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of teaching up front, and they're trying mm-hmm. to figure out what he's saying. And then, you know, he does the, okay, I'm going to do it, but I want you to watch because he did a lot of stuff, a lot yeah. of healing, a lot of miracles and all that. Okay, watch it. And they were amazed. Then after that, it's like, okay, now you go, you guys do it. You know, I'll watch you. I'll debrief with you. Mm-hmm. I'll, we, you know, we can go through that. And then, of course, you, he let he he released them and and sent them out. So I think that's the, I mean that's kind of what when we kept reading the gospels we were like okay we can do this like we can give them what we have and mm-hmm. not all yeah. of it's perfect not all of it's you know I mean mm-hmm. all all that Jesus did but you know what I'm saying like that model yeah. is such a good model. That's right. Okay, so I just want to pause and, and pull back here just for one second, just to ask this question, because I think we've we've heard a lot of your story and, and it's so inspiring. And it's Jill, for instance, for you, like teenagers just started showing up at your house. And it's almost like there was this fire that was started there and you guys were participating with the fire. But there mm-hmm. had to be a moment where you decided mm-hmm. to pour gasoline on that fire to really create something yeah. more, where there was this decision that was made or this light bulb that went off. Mm-hmm. Is there a moment for you? And, and, and Ruth, we're going to ask you the same question. Like, what mm-hmm. was that like, the, the catalyst that just like made it switch into a mm-hmm. greater intensity for this idea of parenting, spiritually parenting others? Yeah, I think, I mean... Like I think I said earlier, originally, I just love being with young adults, but there was definitely a moment when I just thought everybody was like that. Like, I'm not any different Mm -hmm. from anybody else, right? But there, I was in an opportunity uh, job I had where I was working with college students. And actually, one of the leaders um, in the department I was working in came to me and said, you know what? You're really good at this. And I go, what? (laughs) He said, you're really good at mentoring and walking with these young adults, men and women, actually. And so I was like, oh. And so part of it was leadership was calling me out. And then they gave me opportunity to do it. So I had a formal opportunity to do it in my job. But then, of course, that was happening within the church that I was serving at anyway. So um you know, there was people coming to me to ask for a relationship like that. But then there was affirmation of somebody saying, no, you're actually really good at this and calling it out in me. Mm. And so then it gave me more confidence. It was like, oh, it's a thing. Like not everybody's like this. And so, yeah. And then the yes was so easy because for one thing, I had leadership to help me, but I also, I mean, I just loved it. Like I found so much joy in it too, that I thought, okay, this is something I'm made for. And I just loved it. And I still love it. I love that. That's so cool. Ruth, what was it for you? I mean, we we, were tracking that progression Mm -hmm. in you, but was there just like this kind of aha moment that you saw? Uh, Yes. And also the buildup, like Jill is talking about with different people's comments or like working in middle schools and talking to people and people saying, oh man, if you love middle school, you belong there because nobody wants to work at the middle school. Mm -hmm. So realizing that my enjoyment of young people and their zest for life, that carried with me even to the age I am now, which I won't say. So that love was already there. But then when I was realizing that God wanted more for me to, like he had more for me to do with mission, I wasn't sure at first, like in that shift, 
from teaching, I wasn't sure at first if that was going to be with youth or who. So as I was doing my timeline and part of our process, looking back and remembering those moments that I mentioned about those Mm -hmm. dark times and relating to those other kids and seeing how adults had helped me, that was really like the moment of, okay, yeah, this is the the group Mm -hmm. that I care the most about is the age group of young people, not necessarily middle school, but that young people group. And just my, my passion for people not becoming um, dead ends, you know, like the Dead Sea. So as Mm -hmm. I learn, and like Jill talked about that, the gifts, being able to pass that on to the next generation, um, all that kind of came together through that exercise. And so that's really what shifted me into okay, I want to really be a part of parenting and passing on to the next generation what I've learned. That's so cool. So it's almost like your story, when measured against God's story, the collective story started to tell you like, wow, like God has given me a unique voice Mm. to speak to young people in a specific way because of my lived experience. Okay, so I want to. I'm putting myself in the shoes of one of our listeners um, who maybe isn't a vocational ministry, and I feel like, you know, so I, I, I I've got a couple questions here, and I'm just going to dish di- dish them out, um, and then we can sort through it. But yeah. for someone who's saying that's easy for you to say, um, you're you're a vocational ministry. You've created time in your life, in capacity, in order to do this, I have to, you know, Mm -hmm. fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what would you say to encourage someone who's not a vocational ministry, not in vocational ministry, but like, how do you, how do they even find like this idea of, of parenting those who are not your own kids? How do you find if the Lord's leading you in this way? Like, what does that look like? For someone who's got a nine to five or mm-hmm. their their life is full, like everyone I know, yeah. their life is completely full and they don't have capacity for anything more. What would you say, Ruth or Jill, either of you? You go first, Ruth. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> uh, this is one area that was kind of like thrust upon me, um, like Jill's example, is that for a lot of us who have our own kids, we often think we have the fullest lives and that may be true because of all the sports and activities etc but by having such busy lives we may also have the most opportunity Mm -hmm. for our kids friends or acquaintances Mm -hmm. and I've had a daughter who's very social so she we just moved recently she already in the first week she was here had a friend over twice for dinner Mm -hmm. and took her to youth group and like I did not used to be a great hostess because I worried about my cooking or my house cleaning or whatever. And a lot of, I mean, not all women, but a lot of women, we worry about the house and how it looks and don't want people in our space. <laughs> and um, But I realized as a kid, I would rather be invited into someone's space, even if it's messy, just to have a safe and warm environment to be in um, than to have a spick and span you know, place. So I wanted to be more that way. So by letting in her friends and then hosting them at our table, whatever the food happens to be that night, and then having conversation. And one of those friends came to Jesus and started going to church with her regularly, got baptized with her. Like that was not, I don't take credit for that or credit for any of it, just that we provided a space. And so I'm using that as an example that you just start with what you have. Do you have you know, a garage where kids from the neighborhood can come in? Do you have a front yard where it's okay for them to play? And even if you don't have kids, maybe you have a dog or you're the grandma that started recruiting neighborhood kids to come to the youth group and she'd drive them, (laughs) you know, like start with what you have and offer it to those that you see around you, pray for those opportunities. And God will, I mean, it's like the field of dreams. If you build it, build it, they will come. If you have food, they will come. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I love that. Jill, what would you say? Um, there were lots of times when I wasn't in full-time ministry when I was I was doing it. So some of it was kind of like what Ruth was saying when I was raising kids. Um, and then I worked at a couple different universities. You know, I was in an environment where there were young adults all the time. But also, I think, I mean, of course, church, there's people that you're going to get to know uh, through just regular relationships in your neighborhood or in your in your church community that you know, you might be drawn to, or you're just, I think part of it is just, is asking the Lord. And it doesn't have to be like a dozen of them. It can just be one. And I think there were many times where I just 
was doing kid stuff. I was raising kids and I asked somebody, hey, you want to come over and make dinner with me? Or you want to come over and I'm just doing laundry, you want to hang out? Like they also came into my life, which was actually really, I think, encouraging for them because that's a lot of times what they want. They need a different environment. They need um, space even and to be with families that have kids and you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I remember, I mean, there was one time where I was, I had this so much on my heart. I'm like, we have a church full of people. We could like, come on, everybody get somebody, you know, that just mm-hmm. hang out with somebody. But some of the people that, that were in our church were like, I don't know how to do that. They, well, they're not going to want it. Like kind of mm-hmm. like what Ruth said, they don't want to come over to my house, you know? And yeah, they do. They actually do. <laughs> they actually want to mm-hmm. hang out with you. So anyway, we can simplify yeah. it. It's not a complicated thing. Mm-hmm. I think that's really good. I just, you know, for for those who are are listening to this episode, I think one of the things that's encouraged, that I'm encouraged with that you guys are saying is give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Don't try to solve all the problems that present themselves to you in the next week, right? right. There's, I'd say there's, yeah. there's grace to move towards something with the time that you have. And um, one of the other things I think that you guys said from the previous question is just it's just one of those one of those simple things of viewing your life just a little bit differently to find that you actually already have time. You already have the capacity mm-hmm. because you're already doing things in which people have yeah. spiritual needs and they may have what God has built into you already. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's just really a matter of seeing that just a little bit yeah. differently. You know, as as I think about what you guys have said, of certainly as you're desiring just to continue to see God move in other people as he brings them to you, I think for those that are listening, one of the exciting things is, is this kind of an all play, right? It's, it's not ultimately in your control other than saying mm-hmm. yes. And one of the things mm-hmm. that I think Jill said beautifully was my job's really just to listen, mm-hmm. you know? And my job's not to teach, my job's mm-hmm. not to instruct, and my job is not to mm-hmm. own all of the decisions that happen next. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that's where a lot of grace comes in. And my mm-hmm. job's to be available for the time mm-hmm. I currently have to give yeah. and to really trust that God's working on this people. And for my Absolutely. part, yeah. uh, I'm willing to be involved. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. I think, too, um, something that I carry, uh, and even more so recently, is... I have to give everything I have away because I'm not going to always be here. And what's the next generation going to look like? You know, I just feel like all of us have something to give and they're the ones that are going to be coming up. They're the ones that are going to be rising up. And I just feel like I have a certain amount of time to, to tell them all about God, to tell them all about what he does and what he can do and all those things. And like you said earlier, Tim, who they are. And so I just I just feel like walking alongside young adults in that way is the best thing I can give them is everything that I've learned about God and then they can take it and do whatever they want with it too but you know if we don't I don't want to think about what the future looks like if we don't all right. have a part to play in that you know mm-hmm. Yeah yeah I mean and I I think too that the question that comes up just you know there's lots of people that maybe haven't don't realize they may already be people of the faith. And they don't realize yeah. that, but well, gosh, I mean, I feel like I'm actually missing a spiritual parent. Mm-hmm. You know, I have my parents, um, but yeah. I don't really have anyone who's pouring into me in, in that yeah. way. So what would you say to that person that maybe feels like there's a, a spiritual orphan, you know, in, in some ways, what would you, what would you encourage them to do? And even similarly for someone who's maybe listening to this thinking like, you know what, I'm now seeing the relationship I have with so-and-so differently, like what would be a good next step? Uh, Well, I can speak just from my experience. Something I've learned is that one person cannot fulfill all of what you were looking for in a parent Mm -hmm. or spiritual parent. So I've realized that I've had, as I look back through my life, I have like five women for a season, different women who served as kind of spiritual moms to me and but in mm. different ways they spoke into my life or were there for me. Um, but mm. if I expected too much of one person, they wouldn't you know, be able to fulfill that and I'd be disappointed or feel let down or whatever. And so I think, especially as someone who can feel like an orphan, it's easy to put too many expectations on mm. people to be family <laughs> yeah. and they may not be able to provide that. So that's just kind of a caution <laughs> for anyone yeah. who feels like I felt. Um, 
And then this may sound, I don't know if it sounds too simple for people who get this answer a lot, but first to pray about it. Because if, yeah. if you submit it to God, like I had some really desperate moments, like I don't, I don't have friends and I need spiritual parents. And I'd pray and then God highlighted in my mind a person that I already mm-hmm. knew who mm-hmm. I thought, you know, why this person has not really been a, like virtually, I've kind of connected with them, but not really that much in person. But I reached out to the person virtually and for a season, they became that spiritual mom I needed. And then God did provide other people. Mm-hmm. Um, so not that you shouldn't, you know, put yourself out into community, like maybe a church community or a group or somewhere where you're out there. But I think prayer first and God may highlight yeah. someone that's already in your life that maybe you just didn't see in that regard and you can approach them. That's so good because I think, I mean, like you said, it's such a simple answer, but it is the most profound thing because mm. you're we're trusting that God's up to something, right? And yeah. like you said, to notice where, where we are and kind of mm-hmm. what setting we're in and who's around us and just to pay attention to that. So I would say that even for the the person that's looking, you know, maybe I should pour mm-hmm. into somebody or give away what I've been given. Um, mm. And so to first be aware, you know, just ask the Lord, okay, show show me somebody. The other thing is, is I always used to think, you know, if somebody's kind of like hanging around you a lot, <laughs> they probably <laughs> want to like hang out with you. Um, yeah. They're just afraid to ask. And so mm. kind of take note of, I sure see that, that woman or that guy a lot, you know, and, Mm -hmm. um, but also I think even just, if you see potential in somebody, like you just think, God, that, that guy, I, or even like you said about, you know, in your, in your prayer time, you actually can see the destiny on somebody and to be able to just start calling that out in somebody or encouraging them. Um, that's huge for somebody. I I think that was the biggest thing when I was working with young adults is they didn't know who they were. So just if you, if you have some, you know, a sense of that, just to be able to start doing that. And then when you do that, it's like, Hey, you want to come over for dinner or you want to go out for coffee Mm -hmm. or you want to do laundry with me or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) You want to chop wood like Tim would want to do. Yeah. For real. You could get somebody to help you chop wood, Tim. That's the thing, you know, and I've actually, (laughs) you know, I've started to see that as a thing is like, there's things that just have to get done and they are time dependent and it's involving Mm -hmm. people into your busyness that you think they may not want to, you know, even if it's like, you know, yeah, sawing up lumber for some people that, you know, (laughs) don't have to do that. It's actually fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you're inviting them to do, you know, kind of a manly activity that's fun. And there's not a lot of talking going on when chainsawing is happening, but that's hmm. kind of how men like go deep is yeah. they actually the don't say bonding. Anything, you know, <laughs> it's, it's <the> bonding. <laughs> there we go. Uh, well, that's, that's really good. Well, I just want to thank you guys for being here. Um, I say there's so much depth and richness to this. I feel like we are kind of just just kind of scratching the surface mm-hmm. on all of the different ways in which we can both um, become or maybe not become as much as start seeing ourselves um, how God sees us as like having yeah. something to offer. And then also have this realization, like, you know what, like, I'm not a finished product. Mm -hmm. And God may have already built in the answers to the desires of my heart. And he may have already written that into the story of someone else. And I need to be Mm -hmm. shepherded in some way, um, or allow those things to come out of me. And it's vulnerable and all those things. But I really need someone to hear and hear, hear kind of the desires of my heart and help lead Mm -hmm. me and shepherd me, you know, as well, and really parent me no matter how old you are. Um, And that's the thing I would say. It's one of those things where, you know, yes, an older person's doing a younger person if it's a teenager, but sometimes you might find yourself spiritually parenting someone who's older than you, you know, as well. And that's, you know, we didn't even get there. Mm -hmm. Um, But I just want to thank you guys for being here, certainly for your willingness to just deposit um, some of your experience and to those that are listening to this and certainly that the Lord would just bless you guys as you continue to pour into other people and that you would be richly blessed um, mm-hmm. by more stories of activation in pursuing the Lord and that those stories mm-hmm. that are kind of in the dot, dot, dot phase, that they would work out for good 
um, mm-hmm. and that loving the Lord would be something where the, that investment that you guys have made would produce a good kingdom impact. So mm-hmm. Thanks, bless Sam. you guys thank with you. that. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Well, we just heard from two amazing ladies who have found so much impact and influence into other people's lives through just remaining faithful, through listening well, and through just saying yes with boundaries to those that um, have been the people that have been brought up to their doorstep. So here's just some of the things that I hope that you guys heard from these stories that we've heard today. The first one's just a question. It's who are the people that your life attracts? Who are the people that show up to your doorstep? Who are the people that cross your paths? Um, and just ask, answering the question, is there something more here that I need to be aware of? I mean, I just saw a huge importance in just being willing to sit and listen, free of judgment, free of teaching moments, all that stuff. Just listen to the things that people are going through um, is such a helpful part of seeing them move forward. I love that idea, which we talked about, of just the person you least expect, kind of becoming this amazing juggernaut of the faith that becomes a huge encouragement to you and to others, Um, and getting to experience the joy, the joy that you heard in Jill's story of seeing the recognition that comes with that. And it's it's not because of that that they do it, but wow, what an amazing um, joy that they get to experience here on earth that sort of resounds in heaven and eternally. I love the fact that the capacity for ministry is already built into your life. I think you heard that in both their stories and their encouragement to you of just like, you're already doing things. Um, And some of this happens in the things that you guys are already doing. And so kind of giving yourself a little bit of the uh, the benefit of the fact that this isn't an add-on to the life that you're already leading. It's a bonus content of the life that you're already leading and, and, and really focusing conversations you would be having one way or the other on listening well and helping to move people forward. You know, one of the things that I heard in, in these stories was just that sometimes the other people activate something in you that you didn't know was already there. And I think for both of these ladies, the encouragement that they received from other people, other people saw the gifts in the gifting before they realized it themselves, and it increased the expectation that they had to be used, um, and also even the usefulness of themselves, of, of seeing themselves as having something to offer and being willing to sit in that place with other people. It reminds me of um, both the parable, and I think Paul even explains this further, of the idea of grafting people The idea of spiritually parenting others is almost like the Lord is grafting other branches onto yours in a way to feed them the nutrients of kingdom living through being connected with you. So allowing people to be grafted into what God has done in your life, what he's doing through your life today, and what he's doing, will do in your life in the future. And part of that comes from those who are, you know, wanting to whatever, hitch their wagon, you know, to you in some ways, not to mix metaphors on you. But anyway, I love this episode. I love the fact that the Lord invites some of us and probably more than we think possible into partnering with him in exploring what God's love and life looks like in other people that are around us. So I just want to encourage you to think of yourself in that way. And if you're feeling that little tug or that little itch, maybe it's this person Ask God about it and be willing to grab a cup of coffee uh, and listen more and then explore what that looks like for you. So bless you as you go and as you go about your busy day and may God highlight someone in your life that maybe needs something that he's already been teaching you in Jesus name. As we wrap up this episode, we want you to know that you too are called beyond. We believe there is more that God desires for your life than you could possibly ask or imagine. Are you longing for more? You don't have to have it all figured out to take the next step of faith. We bless you in Jesus' name to embrace the courage that's required to obediently follow God's calling. We pray and believe for transformation in the relationships and communities where you live, work, and play. In Jesus' name.
Thank you for listening to today's episode. Call Beyond is a production of Novo Mission, Inc. To learn more about Novo's commitment to multiply movements of the gospel and mobilize the church for that mission, we invite you to check us out on our website at Nova.org or follow us at Novo Mission on Facebook or Instagram. The music in today's episode was written by the band Wild Earth and used with permission from the artist. Thank you again for giving our podcast a listen. We hope you'll join us for more Called Beyond.